Do you like stars? Yeah, me too. And this JWST image has a whole load of beautiful ones just for us. This is a globular cluster of stars that lives on the outskirts of the Milky Way. It's close enough that JWST can resolve individual stars. But one obvious question with this image is why is there a huge gap in the middle, cutting out the very centre of the cluster? A globular cluster is really just a huge collection of stars all bound together by gravity. They tend to have a spherical-ish shape and they're very bright in the center. Not that you'd guess it from this image as we can't actually see the center, but we'll get to that. On June 20th, 2022, JWST stared at this cluster of stars for just over an hour. The cluster, known as M92, is 27,000 light years away and lives in the halo of the Milky Way, which is basically the stellar suburbs of our galaxy. Usually, when JWST takes images, it focuses on or includes entire galaxies. These are collections of billions of stars, but it's often difficult to see the stars individually, and we just see the overall brightness and shape of the galaxy as a whole. Luckily, some galaxies are close enough to see individual stars, but often it's just not possible. For example, in this image. We have four distant galaxies here, here, here and here, in which we can't resolve the stars very well at all. But this galaxy here is much closer, and it's possible to pick out single stars. Of course, lots of JWST images of galaxies also have some foreground stars getting in the way. These are stars that are way closer than the galaxy, and hence look way brighter, and come with these spiky features. They're easy to resolve, but I'm not counting them here. This image of M92 is part of a program to study nearby groups of stars that are resolvable. And in this particular cluster, there are about 330,000 stars in a sphere-like region that's about 100 light years across. This means that the core of M92 is thousands of times denser than our own solar system, but all of the stellar radiation and gravitational interaction probably wouldn't be good for life. So it's likely a good thing that we live in a quieter neighborhood. However, studying such a dense region was a great test for JWST's resolving and imaging power early on in its observing lifetime. This was one of the first images it ever took. This image is useful because it shows stars at many different distances from the centre of the cluster, allowing us to study the motion, formation and composition of the stars, and how that might change based on where they form. M92 is very nearby, so is relatively easy to study. And then we can extrapolate the things we learn here to stars and galaxies that are much further away and harder to image in so much detail. M92 is also one of the oldest star clusters in the Milky Way, at between 12 and 13 billion years old. And so studying such a nearby but ancient object is a great way to learn about the history of stars in the universe. The stars in the cluster will have all formed at around about the same time, and they're all about the same distance from us and they formed from the same mixture of elements. But they also formed at a wide range of masses, making this a really interesting population of stars to study. Since they're all the same distance from us, any differences in brightness of the stars must be intrinsic to those stars, and not just due to some being further away. So again, this gives us a great tool for studying the differences between these stars. The cluster has been previously imaged by telescopes like Hubble, and combining these observations can be very important. JWST images in infrared light, rather than the visible light that Hubble mainly sees in. This makes JWST better at seeing cool, low-mass stars, since they emit most of their light in the infrared, and JWST might be able to image stars down to just 10% of the mass of the Sun. This is particularly interesting, because it's pretty much the lower limit for what a star can be, and lower than that and we reach brown dwarf territory. JWST is also way faster than Hubble at collecting equivalent images. To see those very low mass stars with Hubble would take hundreds of hours of light collecting, but JWST can do it in just a few hours. One of the big differences between this image from Hubble and this one from JWST is, of course, the big gap in the JWST one. So why is that there? Well, this is because of something called a chip gap, and it's a result of the layout of the detectors on JWST. This image was taken with the near-infrared camera NERCAM, 
and the chip gap refers to the physical distance between two detectors. NERCAM has 10 detectors in total, eight which make shorter wavelength observations and two that make longer wavelength observations. These are laid out in two modules, known as module A and module B, where four short wavelength detectors, labeled one to four, have the same field of view of one long wavelength detector, labeled five. The image of M92 was made by combining four wavelengths, all from the long wavelength detectors, and all of them have the same gap to deal with. Interestingly, the team here used that gap to their advantage and positioned it to perfectly block the bright core of M92, since they wanted to resolve the stars further out in the cluster. The exposing time would be long enough that the core would be overexposed and wouldn't contain much useful information. They used the gap like a coronagraph, to block the overly bright core and just focused on the area they were most interested in. If they wanted to image the core, they could revisit with a shorter observing time and combine that with this image to complete the landscape. We have actually seen this chip gap in images before, but we just might not have realized it at the time. For example, in one of the very first calibration images, the chip gap is hiding here in the NERCAM image. Here is some cool, if horribly uncalibrated data that's pretty much the first ever taken by NERCAM. But once again, we see the gap in the middle that's caused by the distance between the detectors. In general though, we don't want gaps in our images. So this chip gap is usually avoided using something called dithering. This is where the telescope will look at an object and take data as normal. Then it moves very slightly so that the detectors can now receive light from a part of the object that might have been covered by the gap and it takes more data. This is repeated over and over a few times, normally four, but it can vary, until the telescope's detectors have been able to get data from everything you want. And then you just combine all of those images together to get a complete view of the object or objects, building up the image with multiple telescope pointings. This image was taken as part of an early release science program and was taken right at the start of JWST's observations. It's one of 13 ERS programs that were designed to help astronomers around the world understand how to use JWST and how to make the most of its incredible science capabilities. There's a great NASA blog with an interview with some of the scientists involved that I'll link in the description if you want to learn even more about the image. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it in the comments below. In the meantime, subscribe if you're new to the channel and you made it this far in the video and thanks for watching. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.